Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. great. <laughs> well, we're going to get started, so we give leave enough time for uh, questions. Welcome to Broker Chat, uh, January twenty uh, fourth. Wow, January flew, didn't it? Um, we are going to talk about the 2022 changes. Of course, this broker chat is for you. And so if you have some questions that might be outside of the 2022 changes, I'm here to answer those questions for you. My name is Deborah Blue. I am the managing broker in the Midtown office, and this is the heart of Atlanta's broker chat. So I know there are other offices on the call today. Um, Again, this is very informal, so if you have a question, since I don't have extra help today, if you will just use your virtual hand and I'll be able to see you pop up and I can stop and answer the question, or you can unmute yourself and ask your question. I'm okay with that as well. So let's get started. Let me start my screen or share my screen, I should say. And if someone could verify that you can see that. We can yep. see it. Yay. All right. So let's see if I can make it through this without losing my internet or anything today. <laughs> so last week I lost my internet and uh, apparently there was some kind of fix that was going on. So that took me down. And I thank Tom for taking over the last few minutes. Tom is out today and he's asked me to take over for his session. All right. Hey, Barbara, I see you pop it up in there. Hey, Deborah, I'm here to give you support today. Yes, I appreciate that. So thank you. All right. So as I always start when I am hosting this, I always say that the even the slightest mistake could end up costing you money, stress, and a tarnished reputation. So it's great to know your contracts and understand uh, what they mean. It's not so much to know what to fill in the blank, but why you're filling that blank in. I had a lot of broker calls this weekend that um, the agents knew what to put there, but then when it comes to negotiation and strategy, you're not sure why you're doing it or, or maybe there's some misinterpretation about it. So let's begin. You'll notice here in um, that we had some new and revised forms. I may squeak past revisions because that's not it's important but it's not as important as actually some of the new forms or new verbiage in here so um, there should be a handout in the chat at some point here I did request that to be done and if it's not there um, at the end of this let me know and we'll see if we can get that to you but these are the main forms that were changed for 2022 almost every form may have been touched in some way and if it was, it was maybe a grammatical error or misspelling or letter out of or number out of sequence. But the, the numbers here are the ones that actually had some changes that we need to bring to your attention. So the first one we're going to talk about is Form 201, which is our moneymaker, our purchase and sale agreement. In the purchase and sale agreement, we talk about an inspection due diligence. And right below the inspection due diligence is an option payment uh, paragraph. And it talks about who receives that option. Now, I didn't realize that this was an issue because in my mind, I've always understood what option money is, even before real estate. And uh, I've had this broker question before, like, well, who, who do we pay it to? And a lot of agents felt like you paid it to the brokerage or whatever. This is money that the buyer is offering to the seller for you know, for whatever reason, uh, I want my offer to be looked at first, or uh, I'm willing to pay you a little extra money that you get to put in your pocket for looking at my contract as the best contract or the best offer, I should say. So what was added to this was that the sell that the buyer shall pay directly to the seller additional option money. And then also we added the ACH. Um, now, what you need to do is if you're in a different market center, I, I know it's kind of tricky in the Midtown market center, but in other market centers, you need to find out from your MCA hub whether or not they accept ACH. OK, so and then also if you're sending it to the seller, you want to make sure they can accept ACH. 
more, more than likely they would prefer a check or a wire transfer. Okay. The other thing that was uh, changed, it was really just grammatical, is either was added and or was uh, stricken through. Now, we all know that the first page of our purchase and sale agreement is the form that we fill the blanks in and then all the subsequent pages behind it give an explanation. So this also gives a further explanation of examining title. So the buyer may examine the title and or was at it before it was just and, now it's and or, they don't have to do both. So they can, they can examine the title and they can examine the survey. This is a further explanation, not so much a change. So this is a revised section where the holder of the earnest money will be paid to holder in the method of payment acceptable to the holder. So remember when I just said a couple slides ago, whether the holder, meaning the attorney, the seller, the brokerage, do they offer all of those options? Wire, ACH, check, so on and so forth. So you want to make sure whoever you're giving that earnest money to that you check with them. Now, with the Heart of Atlanta, we have earnest, uh, the earnest app. And that seems to work with most of the offices because that deposits it's right in. But the attorney may not have that. So the attorney may say to you, that money needs to be wired. So you want to check with them. Okay. Uh, uh, one thing I wanted to point out on that slide also, with some uh, transferring of money in some cases, maybe that recipient is being charged a fee from their bank. And what this paragraph is also talking about, if there is a charge, it's not a, a, a aftermarket charge for anyone, but if there is a charge, then they are going to pass that charge on to your buyer. So say for instance, you're sending $1,000 to someone and there's a $25 fee being um, uh, uh, charged to that recipient, they're going to require you to send $1,025 to cover that. Another section is in the delivery of notice. So a lot of times we are working late in the evening, we're sending uh, uh, counters and so on and so forth back and forth. When you bind, let's use the example of binding a contract and you send it over to that co-op agent, a very good practice would be to give them a courtesy call or a courtesy text. If it's late, you don't want to you know, call on the phone, you can send them a text. If they do not open it, whether it's the seller, the buyer, the it is considered delivered. You may not open it, but it's considered delivered. So if you have a binding date of January 24th and you sent it over, but that agent did not open it until the 25th, your binding date is the 24th, okay? So if you are in this business, make it your business to make sure you check your emails, check your texts, and please, I, I find this to be quite interesting. I don't know how we've gotten away from it, but when you send something to someone, etiquette is to let them know, hey, I sent you an offer. Um, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I'll just go into my email and go, I have an offer, and no one called, <laughs> no one said anything about it. Um, so, you know, our code of ethics and our standard of practice talks about these things, and all of us just took that class. So, or most of us, you know, uh, took that class uh, by the end of December of last year. So, I know we take it for the class, we take it because it's required, but I really encourage you to pay attention to what is said because everything is not a form. Some things are part of our code of ethics and our standards of practice. Okay. I had someone call me this weekend that wanted to know where, where do I find that? And I said, well, that's not something you find. That is part of your code of ethics. All right. Another revised section was just when the broker is authorized to accept notice for the client, except where the broker is acting in a dual agency capacity, the broker and any affiliated licensee of the broker representing a party in a client relationship shall be author shall be authorized agents of the party for the limited purpose of receiving the notice. That little section was revised. And such notice to be, um, any of them shall for all purposes here and be deemed to be notice to the party. Um, and then again, it repeats at the bottom, even if it's not opened by that recipient, 
Okay. Other terms, no authority to bind. This has always been here. However, they did go in and just change a couple of words here um, from here to to there to legalese. Um, and therefore, or to notices signed by broker, but not to the potter. However, if authorized in this agreement, broker shall have the right to accept notices that was just changed on behalf of a party, but not send notices from the broker on behalf of a party unless they are signer to the party. OK, so um, basically, you uh, I'd like to use the example of agents that have transaction coordinators and assistants and other people that are not a party to the contract. Yeah, your transaction coordinator can send over things and so on and so forth, but they're not a party to the contract. They're working on behalf of the broker or of you and mostly you. Um, now, of course, when you have an assistant, there should be forms that you fill out with your broker that indicate that you have an assistant and that um, they are following all the rules, whether they're licensed or unlicensed. So this just kind of clears up who can bind and who cannot. The notice of the binding agreement date. This has always been a big question um, if uh, there's a mistake. And a, a great way to make sure there's no mistake on binding dates, number one, look at your calendar when you're filling it in. And then also using the, um, I call it the dates to remember, but I don't think that's actually what that form is called. And I like to put an offer together, bind it, and then I send over to all the parties the dates. That way, if, if I've made a mistake in counting or something like that, the other agent hopefully will catch it, we fix it, and so on and so forth. So this is basically saying, and I'll read it quickly, notwithstanding any other provision to the contrary contained in this agreement is the express intent of this section that a broker or licensee involved, involved in the real estate transaction, not a transaction coordinator, may perform the ministerial task of filling in the binding date. And I know for a fact, assistants are, are filling that in. Um, and that might not sound like a big deal until it is a big deal. And then two, sending a fully signed purchase agreement with a specific binding agreement date. When they say fully signed, they also mean all the exhibits, all the, all the pages of the purchase of sale agreement, um, any legal description, anything that needs to go in to say, we have a complete contract. Uh, if there's a seller's disclosure, if there's a CAD, all of that needs to be part of the binding. Otherwise, if you've checked that box on the last page saying it's exhibit C, but exhibit C is not there, no one should be binding until that complete contract is there. All right. Um, other objections to the binding agreement. So sometimes there's an objection. Say, for instance, one party thinks it was the 24th, but the other party thinks it's the 23rd. So if that should happen, you have a little bit of a dispute, this paragraph talks about what should happen. If, and this is a new section, by the way, so this is going to be uh, section C4 on the purchase and sale agreement body, and it's, and it's letter K was added. Objection to the binding agreement date. If the buyer or seller objects to the date entered as the binding agreement date, then within one day, we have a new new uh, calculation in our purchase and sale agreement. You know, we have a lot of things in there that count from binding agreement date. From receiving notice of binding agreement date, the party objecting shall send notice to the objection to the other party, and then the objection shall be resolved by written amendment. So this is telling you what should happen. You have an objection to the binding, you have a discussion, you figure out what the correct date is or the date is actually okay, then you wouldn't do anything. But if it's not, then you're going to amend that. That has always been something that I've done, but now it's, it's clear as mud in the contract, what should be done, okay? I just have a quick question. Yes, go right ahead, Stephanie. So, yes, um, so the form you mentioned, it's a 264, reminder of important dates. And Thank for you. the, oh yes, absolutely. And for the all signatures. So let's say we get an offer and we counter back and we don't counter back the financial exhibit. We leave everything as this. We just counter back the terms and conditions of the original offer. And then um, we sign the counter. Do we need to go back and sign that financial exhibit? I'm going to say no if you're using the counteroffer form. However, 
sometimes lenders will ask you to go back and sign that. That is not that is not a contract situation. That's a policy with that lender. So that happens a lot with an FHA exhibit or a VA exhibit where we put everything together with a counteroffer, but then when you give it to the um, lender, the lender may require, based on their policies in their office, and ask everyone to sign that form. That doesn't mean sign everything in the contract, just that form. Now, I have recently had someone call me that wanted everything re-signed. Um, I have a problem with that because if that counteroffer falls off the packet or something like that, or the attorney doesn't get the counteroffer form or whatever the case may be, if that is asked, then I would suggest a best practice would be to do a conformed copy of the contract, what we called in days gone by a clean copy of the contract with all of that information, and then using the special step called conformed copy. That way, if you copy everything over to a clean version and you forget something from the old version, that special step saves you because it basically says, if we forgot something, the old one still stands. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you so Good. much. Would Good. Would you mind just uh, wording it so I could take down the notes to make sure I have that special stipulation right? If we do a clean up, the conform copy. Yes. If you go to your table of content in the uh, GAR forms, go okay. to special steps index. And look for and just type in the search bar conformed and it'll pop up. I can't okay. quote it exactly. I just know what it is. <laughs> okay, perfect. perfect. That's great. Hey, you gave me the resource where to find it. So I'll look. Yes. Yes. Thank you and, so much. And, and thank you for bringing that up, Stephanie. For those of you that are wondering, oh my gosh, where are all these forms? If you look at the special step index and the table of content, it shows all 570 odd forms that we have. I think it's 573. Forms. And by the way, if you're new to the industry uh, and you just heard that number, I can almost guarantee you will never touch all 500. I've been in the business 25 years and I have not touched all 500 forms. I've looked at all, all 500. I've read some of them, but I've never touched all five, all 500. All right. Uh, Carlin, you have your hand up. Yes, I had a question. It kind of goes to the binding date and then the couple things you said a couple slides ago about the binding date. Uh -huh. If a if an agent, we've still got the midnight date, I didn't change that. If an agent sends over a contract to me that is signed but not bound, we have not, or a counter, I should say. Um, it is signed by them, but not bound. It comes in in the middle of the night, but before midnight, so long after I've gone to bed. <laughs> yeah. I, I see it the next morning, The only, and there's a request by the listing agent in the next email to, oh, I sent it over without binding. Could you please bind it for me? Now, these emails did come in before midnight. However, I did not see them until the day after. <clears throat> so when I sent it back to her bound, I used that date that I picked it up. Was that Correct. correct. That is correct. Okay. That's correct. The only thing I'm saying is um, I use that as an example because that is really the reason that was created. Sure. A lot of times people will send it over bound. So if she sent it to you bound yesterday and you just saw it today, your clock started ticking for your contract today. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So now that you've sent it back today, the clock starts ticking tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And then you'll also see the form to do the binding agreement date confirmation is F733. So if there's a dispute, you fix it, then everybody sends a, an amendment, F733 confirms it, and you've, you've fulfilled that, um, that problem with the contract. Great. Thank you. Rules for interpreting this agreement. This is a new section. This talks about in the event of internal conflicts or inconsistencies in this agreement, the following rules for how those conflicts are in, are in, or inconsistencies shall be resolved. So sometime <laughs> days gone by, we wrote contracts on the hood of cars. There was no typing it in a computer. You know, I, I'll even go as far to say, for those of you that remember something called carbon paper, Okay, and typewriters. Now, I'm only 27 and that doesn't sound like a long time ago because technology moves so fast, it's moving right now. But when I started in the business, 
you typed on a typewriter to do your offer with carbon paper. And then computers that were as big as our heads you know, came to the scene and we used dot matrix printers and um, sometimes uh, thermal paper that would fade over time. So um, for those of you that are newer in the business, you've got it made. Uh, so sometimes when we wrote an offer, we typed, we struck through with a pen, initial date and time, and that might that counter went back and forth to the point of having all these different squiggles all over the contract. So then it was like, well, what takes precedent of what? So this is being very clear that if you have any handwritten changes, that will take control over the pre-printed contract. Exhibits take control over the main body of the agreement. Special steps take precedent over the main body. This is why your brokers say to you, when you write special steps and it doesn't answer the following, what, when, where, how, and what happens if, you've left out a loophole for the other party, if they're savvy enough to catch that, to either lose your client's earnest money or it's misunderstood. A very good example is, um, let me use what's going on in our industry right now. I'm, I'm, you, I am going to offer you 50,000 over ask. That's a special step. And then the house doesn't appraise. But the seller says, no, you wrote me a contract and said you write 50,000 over, okay? However, let's say you said something like 50,000 over as long as it appraises for 250,000 not to exceed blah blah blah. You see how I'm adding more on there to seal that special step and it doesn't turn into a nightmare for the broker. Um, there's a, a lawsuit happening right now because the listing agent misunderstood, the seller misunderstood and the buyer is saying, "No, you said you would sell it to me. I would pay this." And so therefore the buyer has dug in their heels, they've hired an attorney and they're going for that house. Okay, it does happen, you guys. All right, notwithstanding the above, any amendatory clause in the FHA and the VA exhibit shall con control over inconsistent or conflicting provisions contained in a special stip. Let me tell you something about FHA and VA. If you have an amendatory clause on your financing contingency, that is to protect that vet, that is to protect that FHA recipient, and writing a special step saying, oh, um, this will end uh, uh, you know, in 14 days or whatever, they're not going to, the lender's not gonna accept that. You're not making any changes to that mandatory clause, so don't do it, okay? Um, so they're, they're just saying here that, that notwithstanding any of these other changes, you're not gonna be able to change that FHA and VA, okay? I have a question, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Who's speaking to me? Uh, Stephanie, again. Hi, Stephanie, go right ahead. So with the amendatory clause, let's say they they do a special stipulation and they say, um, you know, appraisal contingency to be 14 days. So what you're saying is that even though that's a special stipulation, the amendatory clause is kind of more important. Yeah. Okay. And what if... Um, so, so what if they say that they don't want to, they're like, they don't want to take off. So basically we can't take the appraisal contingency of an FHA loan. Well, with the FHA and the VA, that goes all the way to closing. That amendatory clause, th that, that lender is, could care less about you saying you've got to have it done by, you know, 14 days. You could say that, but they're not going to lose their earnest money. They're going to be protected by that amendatory clause. So I guess the amendatory clause is the only one that can get surpassed by a special stipulation. Mm -hmm. and, and FHA and VA amendatory clause, correct. Because they're federally insured loans. Exactly. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And I'm, I'm going to just say my two cents. My father was career army. I'm a military brat, and I really don't like it when people take advantage of vets. They work hard. The reason we're all doing real estate um, and live in this country is because of what they've sacrificed. So I, I have a little soft spot in my heart when I hear people are taking advantage of that. So if there are any vets on this call, thank you for your service. And I respect that. They've earned it. Let them use it.
Okay. The new section of oh, Deborah, okay. Deborah. Hey, Deborah, sorry, this, this, is, this is Barbara. I had a question. Sure. Um, does the um, the USDA have a clause in there of uh, the same like uh, VA and FHA? I, you know what? I don't know because I've not done a USDA. So I'd have to look at that. I'm going to say probably yes, because that's and, also federally backed. And I'll, and I'll follow up on it also. I just thought you might yeah. know. It's not something that I talk about too much in contract classes or because most of Atlanta doesn't qualify. Although we do have, you'd be surprised, some sections of Alpharetta and Marietta and things of that nature that have little pockets of USDA financing, but it's such a small percentage. I don't really talk about it unless someone comes to me with it. Thank you, Deborah. I'll follow up on it. I appreciate that. The next broker broker chat, if you could bring that up, um, that would be nice. There may be someone on the call that might need it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Then there's another new section talking about the day. I cannot believe that the contract committee had to explain to us what a day is, but for those of you that are not familiar with what a day is, a day ends at 11.59 p.m. When you hold your cell phone and it's New Year's Eve, at 12 o'clock, it says January 1st. That's a different day. So a day, now we use lazy language, including me, midnight. We all say midnight, but midnight is the next day. So if you're working on a contract, you have the right to write a special step and say, I need to have this by 5 p.m. That's the end of our, our due diligence. That's the end of our whatever. Instead, but the contract, for those of you that are new to real estate and on this call, the contract always reads, or not, uh, not physically, but understood 11.59 p.m. But the confusion comes in because we use lazy language saying midnight. And midnight is not 11.59. It is the last hour of the day, okay? All right. New section added to all of our brokerage agreements. We're gonna move on to form 101. Exclusive seller brokerage agreement, exclusive buyer agreement, all of these have had this change and this new section added for the definition of a seller and a buyer. I'm not gonna read that to you. It's just breaking down exactly what that is. Um, and who that is, because sometimes there are other parties involved. I, I have a contract this weekend that has three buyers on it. And of course, when I called the lender, I wanted to know why are there three buyers? Who's qualified? You know, all three are qualified or just two are qualified and, and they're just gonna own it in three. You know, these are questions as a listing agent that you have the right to call that lender. And I knew that lender and that lender was very gracious and gave me all the information I needed to go to my seller and say, we have an offer and here's what it looks like. And this is why you see three buyers. And I've gotten confirmation from that lender that, that, that they've pulled everything. They've also opted not to have a financing contingency. And here's why. You see how that makes a seller feel good about your value and how you're explaining the contract to them. Okay, so exclusive seller brokerage agreement. Um, the revised section talks about the following are types of agency not, and they put that in bold. I think it was always in bold, not offered. Sometimes people make the mistake and check things that are offered. So in Georgia, we do not offer sub agency. You will need to check with your office to see if you offer the rest of these. My answer is probably yes. The only thing that would be question mark is dual agency. Every market center is independently owned and operated, even though we have one qualifying broker, we are still independently owned and operated. So therefore, there may be market centers that don't allow you to do dual agency. For those of us in Midtown, we do allow it. Um, we don't encourage it for newer agents if you're not real savvy yet with, with working with contracts. Um, and then there are some of you on this call that don't believe in it at all because you feel like you can't serve two masters. I've never had a problem with dual agency. I've done lots of dual agency, but here's the thing. Here's, here's a better practice. If someone calls you and they say, I wanna see your listing, you already represent the seller. You don't even represent that person yet. And by law, Georgia law and our realtor law, we are supposed to explain agency as soon as we have contact with that person. You probably remember that from ethics. If you don't, 
read that section. You then need to explain agency. In the GAR forms, we have a form called ABCs of agency. It's located in your consumer brochure. Use it for your seller packet and your buyer packet. Then you have fulfilled explaining agency because you've given them a pamphlet they can look at and maybe you've taken an extra step and gone over it. Then you ask that person, how would you like to be represented now that I've explained that to you? You get that brokerage agreement sign or that customer agreement sign or that tenant agreement sign, whatever you're representing, and you move forward. Here's what not anyone on this call, but all the others do. They wait until they're writing an offer and then they get all of that signed. That is a violation technically, okay? Um, because if something comes up and there's a problem, and the broker starts asking, how did we represent you? Or we ask you, how are we representing? And that person says, well, I didn't, I didn't understand that. I didn't want to be represented. Then we have a little bit of a problem as to when all of that was explained and how it was explained and when it happened, OK? I see you, Barbara. I'll get you in two seconds. Now, if the broker offers dual agency as one of the agency relationships, then the seller does or does not consent to it. So if you're in a situation of dual agency, so going back to my example, if I'm representing someone who says, I'd like to see your listing, I explain agency and I let them know right now you're a customer, I represent the seller. I don't need to do dual agency guys. I just need to show them the house with the agency they choose, okay? And I'd like to choose them as a customer first. And I tell them, I'm gonna give you one gimme. We go see the house, they love it, they're the customer, seller's my client. However, if they don't love it, then we can have another CETO come into the office conversation. Then I can explain, well, if you'd like to take this another step, you can become my client, sign the brokerage agreement, and we go skipping down 285 to look for a house. If they buy it, I'm still getting both sides of the commission, it's just that one party is a client and one party is a, a, a customer. We don't have to muddy the waters right off the bat, okay? So just remember that. And that's, I gave you my script. I'm gonna give you one gimme. You're gonna get in the car. We're gonna go look at my listing after I've checked them out and make sure they qualify. And then if they love it, great. If they don't, then I try to capture them as a client. Clear as mud? I'm going to take that as a yes. Stephanie. Where is mud? <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie, and, well, you know what? Before Stephanie, let me go with um, Barbara because I think she had her hand up first. I, I had not taken it down, so I just took it down, Deborah. Oh, okay. you okay. Stephanie, Thanks. you're up. Yeah, so let's say they get that sweetheart deal, right, where you, re you represent both of them. Aren't we obligated to disclose that to the other agents? Because if we give the seller that sweetheart deal, yeah, they're, maybe their bottom line can be less or like, don't we have to put in the stipulations? Like if we do the sweetheart deal, our commission is gonna be different or I don't know, I just I just don't wanna get in trouble accepting an offer where I'm doing dual agency and then an agent says, well, you didn't, I mean, I don't know. I, well, if it's a dual agency, there's no other agent involved. You are the agent. Mm -hmm. Are but you, if but I, if I, I don't know if I understand the question. Okay, so let's say that there's an offer, right, from another uh, buyer who has an agent, and both offers are exactly the same, same terms and conditions. But if I have oh. the buyer as a cons as a customer, and I decide to give my client a sweetheart deal, wouldn't Got I be it. obligated to disclose that to the other agents? So let me start with, there's one word you keep saying, I, what does your seller want? This is a pet peeve of mine as a broker. When, a, when an agent calls me, they talk about I, 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 and I'll ask, well, what does your buyer want? What does your seller want? You don't owe anything to the other agent. If the seller made the decision to go with your sweetheart deal versus the other deal, that's up to the seller, not you. And co-op agents, stop getting mad at someone who is doing that, okay? What, what you're obligated, let me answer your question now. What you're obligated to the other uh, party is to let them know that their offer was presented. That's the problem we have. 
that's the concern a co-op agent has. Because then when they look in FMLS or Georgia MLS and they see that you were both sides, now all these conspiracy theories are going on in their head. But if you are a really good agent, and what I do, I use the rejection offer form, meaning I've submitted your offer and the seller rejected it and I sent it back. We have to be courteous to our co-op agents, guys, and let them know because they have an obligation to tell their party something. And when we don't tell them, then their client customer looks at them like, well, well what happened? I didn't get an answer. I had a, an offer that came in Friday that we went under contract and I had tons of showings for the weekend. I went through my phone and went through every person that set up an appointment and said, we're under contract, sorry. We're under. Why did I do that? To not waste their time showing a property. There's nothing worse than showing up at a house to find out it's under contract, okay? Before it used to be, there was a sign and you'd pull up with your client and go, under contract, I just made this appointment last night. Why didn't they tell me? Now, you might say, oh my gosh, I don't have time for that. That's kind of our job and the value. Okay, it's also a standard of practice. It's part of our code of ethics to be courteous to each other. So if there's anything that I can offer in these broker chats, it's not just learning things, but also the etiquette that we are, we're losing in this industry. I, I don't know why, but what happens, if I could say this to you, you agents that are newer in this business, it's, it's not just making money, filling out contracts and talking bad about the other agent. It's make that other, that other agent is also your customer. And I look at all of you on this call as such. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. Are you perfect? Absolutely not. But we need to be the example. Let me just say it like that. Because there are other people in other companies that are not stressing this. And I'll tell you in our industry, the sellers out here, they respect Keller Williams. And when we misbehave, they look at us like, wait a minute, you're the number one company. We hear about how well you guys are trained, but you behave badly. Now, I have a seller now that's really upset that every time someone went into the listing, they left the lights on or left a door unlocked. I know I'm kind of deviating from what we're talking about, but I just want to make sure that I answer your question. And that is, you don't have an obligation to tell them about your sweetheart deal. That's between you and the seller. But you do have an obligation to say your offer was presented. I also submitted an offer, you know, and you don't have to tell that. But at the end of the day, they just need to know that their offer was submitted, but it was rejected or the, the seller decided not to counter. Okay. Thank you. By the way, sellers do not have to counter. So for those of you that think they need to give me an answer, they do not. All they have to do is put a sign in the yard and sell their house. That's it. Okay. Until that, that changes, you know, I, I don't know if that'll ever change. Barbara will be able to probably tell us that. And thank you. Somebody, uh, Barbara said that that's professionalism. That's exactly right. If you're in this to be professional, that's exactly what it is. All right. This new section about commission, a separate commission on lease. Notwithstanding the above, if the seller leases the real property. So what this section is talking about, when you fill out your listing agreement, you are putting the commission easy because you're talking about that at the listing appointment. But what we have found is most people don't put anything about the leasing part. So there's going to come a time where this aggressive market is going to fade. I'm already starting to see signs of it, although I think we're going to have a very strong 2022. But I'm... I'm I see a little bit of, of slowing down. Rates are changing a little bit. They're still great, but you know, people are taking their time. They're looking, they're going back a second time, things of that nature. So when that happens, uh, the seller might say, you know what, we've had this on the market for you know, 100 days uh, you know, or 200 days or whatever. I don't think I want to sell now. I think I'm just going to lease it. Rents are high right now. I'll make a few dollars and then we'll try this again next year. But then you don't have anything written in there for a lease after you've paid for photography, you've paid for staging, you've had a, a transaction coordinator and, and you've got some expenses here. And now instead of having the listing and they go and find some other company to lease it or they lease it themselves, 
they're obligated to pay you a, a, a leasing fee if you have filled it in. If you have not, guess what? You're going to come to your broker. You're going to be upset. You're going to roll around on the floor like a five-year-old. And we're going to tell you N-A means N-A. Zero means zero. There's nothing for us to fight for. Okay, so make sure you're filling that in. And when you talk to the seller about it, you let them know in the event that you decide to take it off the market and lease it instead, then my fee will be X, Y, Z. Okay. Um, buyer's obligation of the commission. This is a big change. When we fill out a buyer's brokerage agreement, same thing happens. Everybody just automatically puts or doesn't put if, hey, by the way, seller, I mean, I'm sorry, buyer, I'm used to making 3%, but sometimes the listing says zero. I can't even believe that. I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard about it. 1%, 2%, 2.5%, .5, but my, I work for three. So in the event the seller is only paying 2%, I'm going to need you to pay the difference. And on the form, you may put three, but when you explain it to the seller, you may say, that's to cover me if the seller pays nothing. However, if the seller pays at least 2%, I'm going to need you to pay the one. I know a lot of you are probably going, I have to explain that now. You should have been explaining that forever. But now, because of the DOJ and NAR kind of fighting right now, um, this, of course, starts in the West. And we all know things start in the West and move East. Um, what is happening, buyers are saying, well, buyer agents are telling me that, they're, that their services are free. Our services have never been free. What our services have been, have been paid by the seller because the seller offers us a co-op commission. But we have noticed in this aggressive market that that is not always the case. And with some of the new construction uh, uh, builders out there offering nothing, and they're saying, you know what, you need to pay, you need to have your buyer agent pay. OK, so you've got to start. We're already supposed to explain agency and when we explain agency. We then need to explain that this is how it works in Georgia. And I know it's very easy to say, oh, you don't have to worry about it. the seller's going to pay me. Well, we are in a different market now, and this market might not ever go away as far as some of the practices, I should say, that people are like, you know what? I like this practice. We're going to keep it and we're not going to offer any commission. They need to get it from the buyer. Hand up from Amy. Go right ahead. Yes, I'm um, just wondering if, if anyone on the call or if you've talked to anyone who has um, had these conversations and what has been the reaction. Because I think the public, you know, as you say, thinks it's quote unquote free, even though it isn't. But, you know, I'm just wondering if there's pushback. I will tell you, I have always done this before this became written as a new section. Um, years ago, I had a for sale by owner client that I worked with um, back in the day when we advertised on TV and he was the sales rep and I was advertising on TV. He bought a for sale by owner. For sale by owner did not want to pay me. I had already had a sit down meeting with him that most commissions offer a co-op to me, but in the event you buy, and at the time I said a for sale by owner, then you're going to be obligated to pay me. He could not pay me at the time. I went to my broker and my broker said, let's set up a note. And he paid the commission over three months. Now, that's just an example, but I have never had pushback when I explain that because I always get an agreement signed before butt hits leather, okay? I don't take anybody out that's not obligated to me. I don't have time for that. So if there's anybody on the call that would like to say, hey, I did have some pushback, that's great. But unfortunately, this is here to stay, and we as professionals are going to have to be very straight with it. Now, here's what I've heard the last time I taught this in contract class. Well, could we just pull the listings that are 3% and not show anything else? As a broker, that makes me very nervous because if that buyer, because of the world we live in now where everything is very accessible to them online, find something and wonder why you didn't show it and it has to do with the commission and you've not explained this, that's going to be a broker call. I already know it. I'm waiting for it. So and Deborah, and you know what? And it's also going to become a fair housing violation. Yes, I, that's where I was going. Steering, fair housing. It's going to open a whole new can of worms 
if we don't suck it up, buttercup, explain this. And wouldn't you want to explain this ahead of time and know whether or not you want to move forward? You're going to make a business decision to say, okay, I'll accept whatever the commission is or say, you know what? I'm going to write on your brokerage agreement that if it's zero, we've got to figure out a way to do it, whether we bump the price up or, you know, whatever we do. But those are strategies that I'm not going to get into on this call. But I just wanted to let you know, does that answer your call, uh, answer your question, Amy? Yes. Um, I think I, I think the important thing is I have to figure out how I want to handle it. Um, yeah. I, the, the, the tricky one is um, my buyers who are at a lower end and there is just no way they uh -huh. have money for a commission. So I have to figure out that just may be pro bono work. Well, I wouldn't say pro bono. Just be honest with them and say, this is how it works. I know you're kind of on a, you know, first time buyer situation. Money is tight. You know, sh should we just look at things that are going to offer to pay me? I mean, you've got to let them make decision. The right. problem where agents get sued and get in trouble, you keep putting I in the sentence instead of letting them make the decision. Once they make the decision, now you've got it in writing. They've given you permission. I would write it in special steps on their buyer brokerage agreement. Uh, buyer has agreed that we will only look at properties where a 3% commit, a two to 3%, whatever your money okay. amount is. That's how I would handle it. And that's how I do plan to handle it if it becomes a pushback for me, but it hasn't so far. Okay, thanks. Okay, you're very welcome. And Deborah, I just want to add on to that if I can, because the um, myth is that the seller is totally obligated to pay the commission. And what our guidelines say is that the seller typically pays That's commission. Right. That's right. And, and so therefore there could be an expense for the buyer um, to pay commission uh, on the buyer side. And with that being said, when you have the conversation with them up front, they are more prepared um, mm -hmm. than when you have that conversation later on, because we all will make ways for the things that we want. And if you want to purchase this house and you have to pay me a small percentage, you will figure it out. That's I right. Just I just don't want you to have to sell one of the children. This is, <laughs> this is what Barbara just summed up this slide right here, that basically if the commission is 3%, and the buyer agreed in their buyer's agreement, I mean, I'm sorry, 2% and the buyer agreed to pay something, they're gonna make up the difference. That's what this is talking about. And what was stricken from our contract where this is a revised section is buyer normally pays commission in the event seller does not pay the broker, blah, blah, blah. But now it says that that buyer is gonna be obligated at the closing of the transaction to pay that difference. Okay, thank you, Barbara. All right. I did something here. Let me see. There we go. All right. Um, buyer uh, buying property sight unseen. We had a lot of this in this very aggressive market. This is now addressing that. So remember, everybody learned in, in, in uh, Real Estate 101, when we got our license, we know nothing about nothing. <laughs> and so they're holding, we are putting in here that if you decide to buy this house, this is a new section, sight unseen, you don't get to blame us once you move in and close, oh, you didn't show me this in the FaceTime. You didn't show me. They chose to do that. Again, you have a special step section in your brokerage agreements. Start putting things in there. If, if I tell the seller I'm going to give them a sweetheart deal, I write it in the special step. That way we have it in writing. And it's not just a conversation. If I tell the buyer that anything then I write that on their brokerage agreement in special steps. Okay, so start using that if you're not using, uh, you know, there's probably a handful of you that are going, oh my God, I've never written anything on special step. All right, I can't understand why my doohickey started acting up. But anyway, um, buyer in, uh, enters into a con contract to purchase real property during the term of this agreement and later closes on the same, even if the closing is after the expiration of the agreement where broker has not paid its entire commission. This is a default. If the buyer enters into this contract and they don't pay, there's a default. There's an opportunity that the, the uh, brokerage could sue that buyer. But I'm going to just tell you a lawsuit to do this is, is a lot. So when you come to your broker with something like this, then we are going to need to 
have a lot of documentation as to what you said, what you did in order to go after something like this. Know that with Keller Williams, we share in the attorney fees. And um, so just use that with caution when you decide to, to go after a buyer or a seller. Okay, let me go. In there, but anyway, closing costs, prorations that was just revised um, as to um, who pays the taxes and the prorations. Nothing, nothing big there, other than um, if there's any kind of preferential tax, and that usually happens in land deals. Um, so, for those of you that have worked in land deals, this is form 213, and that's the only thing that was really revised there to talk about preferential taxes. Temporary occupancy, this talks about the seller shall have the right to continue to occupy the property for however many days from the date of closing until blank. So you need to put a time there. And then it explains that that seller is not really responsible for that house anymore, you, your buyer is. So if something is not working, let's say their temporary occupancy and the AC goes out, the buyer might say, well, the seller's in there, they can fix it. No, you're the owner now, you're gonna fix it. Okay, and that's basically what this slide talks about. And they shall be buyer as the new owner shall be responsible for making all the repairs of the property. Okay, if there's any holdover, you can put a dollar amount for that. I suggest you do that. As a broker, I notice that people don't put anything there, and whatever you put there, you need to make it hurt. It needs to be a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, so that that uh, if that person holds over, they need to be. Um, paying you that money. Uh, one way of getting that money is to see if the attorney will do a, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, hold an escrow of money, and then that can be released um, once they move out and you walk through and everything is fine, but you've got to figure out how you're going to run your business, how to collect that, because one thing I do not want to be is a bill collector. The seller shall remove seller's personal property from the property prior to the occupancy of the property by the buyer, except for those items that are remaining. So if something was negotiated, that's going to stay, and that's how um, that should be handled. And that's the new section. So again, we are telling the seller, get all your stuff out <laughs> and, and your personal property, um, because the seller most likely is moving into another house or they've got some kind of storage pod or whatever. And then um, that way the buyer can move in except in, in, and find that the things that are there are the things that they negotiated. Now, other than due diligence, the other inspection that we have is called the property sold with right to request repairs. This section was uh, revised. And what it says is buyer does not elect to buy the property as is, this agreement shall terminate. And buyer shall be entitled to the return of their earnest money, okay? So when you're doing the right to request repairs, and the buyer elects not to buy the property as is because they've sent all their repairs and the seller said no to all those repairs, they have the right to get their earnest money back. If they go beyond the time frame that you filled in on that blank, they've waived that right. So this has just been revised to say, instead of fighting over who's gonna get the earnest money, we're now telling you the buyer will get their earnest money as long as they are within the agreement terms, okay? Seller's property disclosure, all they did was change solar to alternate energy source. Um, if you have um, a sewer plumbing situation with a well that you give the date of service and testing, that's new and revised. Same with the termite section of our property disclosure. All they did was revise and change things to wildlife. I guess <laughs> in Georgia, we pretty much have all of these squirrels, bats, mice, possums. So they just said, you know, wildlife. Um, in this section was deleted about the cost to maintain the bond. Agriculture disclosure, if the property, meaning land or uh, uh, a lot, most likely land, um, if they're receiving any kind of preferential tax treatment. For those of you that are land agents, you'll know what, what I'm talking about. Revised section, use of approved mortgage lender. So when we go to our conventional and um, not conventional, but all of our financing with the exception of cash, 
um, there's a section on there that talks about the approved lender and the loan denial letter. There's a section that most agents don't fill out. I noticed the agent that sent me the offer did not put the lender on there. Right. If they are ever declined, they can only give a decline letter from the named mortgage lender in the contract under section six. And it's on the first page right below the little graph where we put in the terms. And then right below that, it talks about the mortgage lender. You should be putting, if there's three lenders that your buyer's looking at, put all three. That means all three of those lenders could give a decline letter. If we don't have a decline letter, and we don't have a, a, let's say you put Supreme Lending, but the buyer goes to Bank of America, Bank of America, Supreme approves them, but Bank of America declines and they try to give you a decline letter, they're in default because the only one that can give a decline letter is Supreme. So when you have that conversation with the buyer, find out who they are talking to. And if they change, then what should you be doing? An amendment to the contract to say, all parties understand that the use of an approved mortgage lender uh, for this transaction is now Bank of America. Okay, that way that protects your buyer to be able to give a decline letter from that lender. So if you're representing the seller and it's blank, can you put in your preferred lender? Sure, you could counter anything there, but you know, everybody has to agree to that. So but to I counter, have, mm -hmm. I guess I would, we would just have to send a counter offer saying mm -hmm, everybody mm -hmm. agrees to, okay. Yeah, so in the counter offer, you would say for section six, mortgage lender, supreme lending shall be, you know, an approved lender for a decline letter. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. So Deborah, um, Deborah, 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 if, if she does that, um, will they will the buyer have to actually go to that lender and apply for the mortgage? Well, that's a negotiating thing. You okay. know, you're going to negotiate. The buyer can say, you can put that on there, but I'm not going to them. Or I'll check them out and see, but I'm not going to them. What you're doing is protecting that a denial letter. If you're trying to get your earnest money back, we need to have a denial letter from whoever you put on this form. And that's it. Okay. And if you don't put anything, listing agents, you're leaving yourself open to they can walk away because you didn't let you didn't put anything on there. So they can give you a, a decline letter from anyone and walk away. Okay. Leases, this section was just revised with some different um, terms instead of the lengthier terms they have here. So nothing really here other than early termination by landlord shall or shall not to uh, terminate the lease early and then what kind of early termination fee they would give to the tenant. Okay. Uh, lease for residential property. This just goes into more explanation. It was revised based on the, the front page. Further explanation, denial of access and right of access. Visitors may take photos and capture. This is letting you know that um, we have a form that if you are listing a property that a tenant lives in, we have a GAR form. I don't know the number, but it's called uh, permission to take videos. I'm paraphrasing that. But if you type in video, it'll pop up. And you really should get permission because that tenant did not give you permission to list the house, the seller did. But what the tenant didn't give you permission is to have a photographer come in and film you know, personal property or pictures or whatever. So you always wanna make sure that you get the seller to get the tenant to sign that. You don't need to approach the tenant. That's the seller's responsibility, okay? Um, because sometimes the buyer might come in and say, oh, I wanna, do you mind if I take some pictures of the kitchen or, the bedroom so I can remember it or whatever. You need to have permission for that. So when I am there, it's showing a property, I'll ask the seller if they're there, is it okay for us to take video? Or I'll ask the agent, is it okay for us to take video before I do it? I don't just do, I just don't let my clients do it. Miss Deborah, can I add yeah. one more thing? And I'm yeah. sorry, I keep butting in. No, you're fine. That's what this is for. Um, Miss Deborah, it's also been recommended from NAR and GAR that when we, when our sellers have uh, video equipment in their house that we should probably put something in the listing that there is surveillance in, uh, cameras in the property. Yes, I do that in my private remarks. So um, that's a courtesy to you guys that if, and when I'm taking a buyer out and I see a ring doorbell or whatever, I'm going to assume there's other listening and camera devices. So in special private remarks, as long as the seller agrees to that, I will let them know 
you know, there, there's a security system with cameras, so on and so forth. Many people have some type of ring doorbell or whatever uh, company you use, but a lot of people do have those type of things right now. So you want to be careful. When when I go into a home with a buyer, I'll say they have, it looks like they have a, a ring doorbell. Let's assume that they have other listening devices or, or things of that nature. Just go in and look, and then we can step away from the house or get back into the car and discuss anything. Um, I have a, an investor, I don't work with him anymore, but he got a kick out of having his cameras in the house and listening to what people were saying. And then he would get upset if they insulted it. And it, I just feel like it's, it's, it's wrong, first of all. And it, it waters down the strategy of the buyer to say, well, I think I wanna ask for this and that. And the seller's already forming their opinions of what they will and will not do. I just don't think it's fair, but that's the way we live now with cameras everywhere. So just inform your clients. We don't need to talk about it while we're in the house. Let's just go in here and look. And as we're going to the next one, we can talk about it. You know, So just be very careful with that. If you feel inclined to let agents know that's going on, you would put that in the private remarks. Okay, option agreement was revised. Basically, this is the form that if, say for instance, your seller, uh, your tenant is leasing a property and you're giving them an option to buy it, they would get the first right of refusal. And this is basically talking about that. Now, what I will tell you is because we have a lot of changes, it's now one o'clock. For those of you that would like to stay, I'll finish this up. For those of you that cannot stay, you should have in the chat, um, the handout of all the changes. And then of course, you can always reach out to your own broker or you can contact me. I'm at dblue at kw.com is my broker email. Don't send it to my team email because you'll get lost in everything else. Um, but the dblue at kw, I keep that reserved for broker questions and calls. Um, if you need my number, it's 770-480-4470. All right. So thank you for those of you that um, did attend and for those that you that would like to stay, I'll continue on. OK, uh, Deborah, just mm -hmm. FYI, the document is not in the chat. Mm. OK, hmm. you know what? I think somebody is taking over from Nyala because she's out. Um, and so they did not put that in there. And I don't, yeah. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, Deborah, I don't have the. Uh, appropriate documents uh, to put in. Okay, let me do this. Let me get through this. And if you will put your email in the chat, we'll make sure you get the form. All right, thank you for, for that, Deborah. Sorry, I was, I'm covering for Niale, it's Pierce. So I'm yes, trying to- I, 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 knew, <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was this week and this wasn't my week to do this, it was Tom's. And yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, so we're all kind of like piecing it together. So <laughs> thank you so much, Pierce. Absolutely, so I'll, I'll keep it running and everything keep going for you. Okay, yeah, we're, we're, we're almost done here. Perfect. Uh, let's see, where was I? Um, this is just a continuation of revising the wording. That's all there is to that. So if you uh, work with option agreements, then you want to go and read that. And this is just more continuation of how you can send the money where we talked about ACH that was added. Um, this is talking again about the purchase and sale agreement. If you were giving that tenant an option to buy the property, you're going to talk about what that price is and um, if there's any other credits or payments that need to be made in order for the ability to have this option. Just more revised. Very few people do that. Community association is a big one. Um, I had to explain to the agent who sounds like she didn't take a contract class. Um, she did not wanna show my listing because the associate, the assessment was 50, she did, her buyer thought there was an assessment of $5,700. And what the sentence says is the total annual is $5,700, but it, it is paid monthly. So somebody didn't read the whole sentence. They just saw the word assessment. And I said, there is no assessment because this was a text going back and forth. I said, no, there is no assessment. The, the monthly did go up. And she said, well, you have on this form that there's an assessment of 5,700. And I said, did you read the sentence? I said, oh, the word assessment 
is the same as what it used to be as the monthly or, or annual fee. A special assessment is what you're talking about, and we do not have a special assessment. So you may run into that with agents not reading this form. Um, so just make sure that you explain that to them. Then now they've fixed the form where a lot of everything is on the front page and it's all in sections now instead of spread out over two or th I mean, it's still two or three pages, but now they've brought most of the things that we have to fill out to the front. So it yes. is a little bit neater. Yes, we're sir. trying to make we're trying to oh, make it a uniform with the rest of them. Yeah, so that it looks like our purchase and sale agreement. It looks like our brokerage agreements. Um, and I'm noticing that's a trend every year that they're starting to fix those forms so they're a little bit more uniform. You're also going to have the section that also was revised where the contact information for the association and for the master association. For those of you that work a lot in Midtown, in town, Decatur, where we deal with a lot of high rise. Uh, mid-rise properties. We also deal with live here, work here, play here. And sometimes those have both an association and a master association. So you want to ask the seller that when you are listing those type of properties. And if you don't know what that is, you can talk to your broker or you can talk to me after. Here's where I was talking about the word assessment and special assessment. So you notice right here where it says the total annual assessment paid to all to all the above selected associations is, and I had 5,700 per year. <laughs> and it's paid and the box monthly <laughs> was checked. So when that person came to me with assessment, I'm like, where did I, did my assistant type somewhere there was assessment? Then I realized this agent did, did not know the, the words had been changed for 2022. And I explained that to her. If there is a special assessment under consideration or uh, your seller has indicated to you that oh, we got our notice that it is going to be changed January 1st or whatever the case may be, then section four is where you would, you would um, put that information there. Please be very careful about these assessments. This is becoming a big, big problem in our industry where uh, sellers are not maybe opening up their emails from the HOA or not going to the meetings and things are being discussed, especially for older townhomes, older communities where people are starting to do um, siding changes, roof changes. I went through this last year with a property that it was under consideration. It wasn't under consideration, it was discussed. You know, if it's just discussed, that's one thing, but if it's under consideration and there's something that says that and what it could be, um, make sure you get a copy of the bylaws and read through them. Upload them on FMLS so that your co-op agents that write offers on your properties can easily pull it down and give it to the buyer to read because it's their responsibility to read, not our responsibility to read and explain to them. Okay, but you do want to look at it so you know. And in the one that I received, I highlighted that if they did have something under consideration, it was going to be about $200. But the person who wrote the offer didn't read it and went back and forth with me and it was an issue. So um, just make sure you, you question, Barbara, sure, go ahead. This is Stephanie. Um, about the special assessments, how true is it that now it's a little bit harder with the HOAs getting all those documents since what happened with the condominiums in Miami? I, I can't speak on Miami because I'm not licensed in Florida. All I can speak on here is when you go to your listing appointment, let the seller know how important it is to get this information. If you have to give them this community association disclosure to say, send this to whoever your representative is so that we can get this answer. A lot of communities have a Facebook or a website friendly, realtor friendly, where you can go in and download things yourself. But that seller is the owner and it's their responsibility to give that to you. Technically, now I taught this in on one of these broker chats. Technically, the only time we have to provide this information in when, is when it's brand new, meaning the, the builder to the original owner. Beyond that, we don't have to. We don't have to give the buyer anything. But there's but because of practice over the many, many years, and because of the office policy and using the GAR form, 
that is where that comes from that you are saying, I need to have the bylaws, I need to have this. If they request it, of course you want to try to get it. And if, you, if your seller doesn't have it, you may have to tell the, the buyer, well, in order for you to get it, you have to go to this site, something like condo certs and download it yourself and it's $250. Well, how many buyers, if they're not going to buy the house are gonna do that? Probably very few. And how many sellers have told you, you know what, when I bought the house, I didn't get one or I didn't get it. So it's really gonna be a conversation with that seller. Technically, if, if anybody has the red book, go read that section. The only person who has to receive by law, the bylaws, the everything is the original owner when the builder created the condom, uh, the association and they give it to the first buyer. Beyond that, when that buyer is a seller and they sell to the next person, they are not obligated to give it to the next person, which is why I think a lot of sellers sell and no one ever asks for it, no one ever looks for it until there's an issue. And I, I think as a really good practice, as realtors, we need to make sure we get it or find out where they can receive it. So that way you don't have people um, running a business out of their home and they cannot, or they own a eyelash business and they have a Volkswagen Beetle decorated like a big eyelash sitting in the driveway or something like that. I'm just making that up, but it probably exists. So just make sure that you are adding value by letting the, the buyer know, I'll do my best to get this from the listing agent and the seller. But if not, you're going to probably have to pay for it yourself or something like that. Okay. And another and another thing it covers in there, especially for sellers that are looking to purchase to rent, it'll let you know if there are rental restrictions. That's right. That's right. Community. That's right. So, um, and a lot of the communities are, you know, overextended now. Um, it's very unusual to find one that doesn't have any restrictions, but, uh, and restrictions just mean the percentage of homes that are already leased because you start messing up your balance of, of communities getting funding. If you have a, uh, more uh, tenants than owners. Transfer initiation administrative fees. Always remember for those of you that are new or maybe some of you that are seasoned and you, you don't realize this, that when you sit down with that seller, you need to ask that seller, check with your association, especially if you've had an increase, did any of the other fees change? Did the initiation fee change? Because if they don't put the correct numbers on here, if it's $1,200, and then you find out at closing, it was really $1,500, your seller is going to pay that $300 difference. Okay. So, just, and there's nothing worse than getting to closing to see an extra $300 and you can't figure out why your seller is going to look at you and expect you to pay it. You don't have to, but that's what's going to happen. So then you're going to reach in your pocket and say, you know, take it off my commission. Find that out at the beginning and make sure they understand if you fill this in and tell me it's 1200 and it ends up 15, you will be paying, you will be paying the difference, okay? And then of course, key terms, that really didn't change. Um, they just kind of pulled everything together, the litigation violations, all that, just make sure you, I put that in here to make sure you just ask those type of questions. So there wasn't really a whole lot that changed. And then of course, explaining assessment and special assessment. So we all have to change our lazy language from monthly fee to assessment now. It, it, it's hard for me too, because I'm so used to saying the monthly fee or the annual fee and then special assessment. So all of it's assessment now, okay? Um, repairs made by seller during a transaction. This is a new special step that was added, I like. Seller will obtain any required permits and or certificates for the completion of the repairs, construction as is made part of this agreement and provide buyer with applicable documentation. You guys have been using this for years saying, we want proof of repairs and receipts. This is a more professional way of saying that. And it's special step 317. And if I were you, another best practice would be make this part of every contract you write. Okay, I plan to. I, I already write something similar to this, but now the attorneys and the contract committee have provided it to us. And so I will always add that. There's certain special steps that I add on every contract. It's just a standard way of writing my contracts. Okay. Thoughts and questions. See, we made it. We just had a few extras in there. I wanted to make sure. Any thoughts or questions? 
This was so helpful. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And thank you for staying and participating. Great job, Anyone Barbara. else? Thank you. Amy, did you, your hand is still up. Did you still have a question or that's an old hand? Forgot to put it down. Sorry. Okay, no problem. No problem. Anyone else? Hey, Thank Janice, you. I see your Wait. ceiling fan. <laughs> awesome job. Always, this is why I come. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you guys. You guys have a great day. Thank you for staying.